Hello everyone, so today I'm here to do another recent reads video or a reading wrap up. I don't know why calling it a recent reads made no one watch my last video. I will start calling it a reading wrap up rather than a fucking recent reads like Jesus Christ. Um, I hate the algorithm. It's so stupid. But anyways, today I'm just going to be talking about the books that I've read since the last time I wrapped up books. I've actually been reading a ton. Um, I think I've read like I'm not counting it by months anymore, but I think I read like 17 books in the month of January. So I obviously already had an another recent reads video and now this is like kind of the second half of the month. I don't know if they'll be this frequent <laughs> with my wrap ups, um, but I'm, I'm on a reading roll right now. So I actually have a bunch of books to talk to you guys about. So let's just get on into it. So firstly, a book that I actually finished by the time I did my last video, but I totally forgot to include it, was Nothing But Blackened Teeth. This is a very, very short horror novella that a lot of people have been talking about because the cover is stunning. I'm obsessed with this cover. Um, not with the book. The book was trash. I'm so sorry. I thought it was not very good, but I seem to be in the majority here. Um, it was just so... Like, what even was this story? I just thought it was really bizarre and also I just I didn't understand what the point of it was I guess. It wasn't scary, it wasn't very atmospheric and also it definitely played into a lot of horror tropes without actually like making a commentary on them. Like I don't mind when you have just really stupid unlikable characters getting killed in a horror movie if you kind of acknowledge it that that is the trope but with this I just was like I don't know, it was just a lot of characters I didn't give a shit about and things happening to them that I didn't care about because I didn't care about the characters. They were all just awful people and I just didn't care. I don't mind unlikable characters, I actually really enjoy unlikable characters a lot, um, which I'll talk about in another book in just a couple minutes, but um, this one was just... it really missed for me and again I think I'm in the majority here with that so I don't feel that bad saying that. So I give that like a two star. It was just wasn't great. I also was like, why does it have to be set in Japan? Like, why is this book set in Japan and like about J Japanese ghosts and stuff? It just felt like I had so many questions, but why? So two stars. Speaking of unlikable characters that I absolutely loved, Bullet Train by Kataro Isaka. This is a book that I have been anticipating for so long. I was so excited to read this book and I'm so happy to tell you I absolutely loved this book. This is a five star. I would not be surprised if it's on my favorite books of the year list. I think this might be my favorite thriller ever. Oh, I loved it so much. So okay, let's just get into this. So this is a thriller, a Japanese thriller, which I will just throw it out there that I am a person who I really do prefer Japanese thrillers to Western thrillers. Western thrillers rely way too much on the twists and like shock value while Japanese thrillers just focus so much more on the characters and the atmosphere and like kind of winding together an actual story that isn't solely reliant on gimmicks. Um, and I just, I love Japanese thrillers so much. All of my favorite thrillers have been Japanese so far. So, like, this one, I really, really recommend this one if you're a big fan of Devotion, the suspect, Devotion of the Suspect X, right? The Devotion of Suspect X by Kiko Higashino. That was probably my favorite thriller, and then this one beat it. I just, oh, I'm so obsessed with this. So, how do I even talk about it? Firstly, I got this pitched to me for as for fans of Train to Busan because obviously you are in this very tight like space on this train because the whole book takes place on the train you never get off the train um so I was told that it was for fans of Train to Busan and I definitely really recommend for this for people who like those kind of enclosed space horrors which I feel like it's a very specific thing but if you like it you know what I'm talking about I think Riley Marie might have talked about this in one of her videos that she really likes that trope in a thriller is that tight space that you can't escape from so firstly we follow a man oh god what was his name I'm sorry I'm not gonna remember a lot of names Kimura um who is a man who his son was recently hospitalized because he was pushed off of a roof of a department store and he used to be a hitman 
and he has decided he is going to go kill the boy who pushed his son off the roof and the boy is on the train. The boy happens to be named Satoshi. He is called the Prince. He is the most fascinating character I've read about in a very long time. I think he would probably make my list of favorite characters of all time at this point. Um, but we'll see if I sit on that for a little longer, if that continues. And then we have, um, Nanao, who is another hitman. We follow a lot of hitmen who all ended up on this train, um, who he is called the unluckiest assassin in the world. And he basically is on this train trying to steal a suitcase that he doesn't know what's in the suitcase. His job is just to get the suitcase. And then we also have Tangerine and Lemon, who are hitmen duo, who have the suitcase that Nana is trying to steal. And they also have the son of a very, very proclaimed um, like mob boss. Uh, they saved him from being kidnapped and they're trying to just transport him and the suitcase of something to his dad. Um, so we have, what, four hitmen on the same train, two young boys, and then a whole bunch of other characters that we encounter. We encounter the professor, we encounter just tons of different characters, and it's fantastic. And basically just how these stories kind of come together. The stakes are very, very high. We have this very looming presence of this mob boss that is basically just terrifying for everyone. We also have another hitman called the wolf who ends up on this train at one point um, and the hornet. And oh, it's just so many things coming together. As you can probably tell, this suitcase, trying to steal the suitcase from these hitmen who were trying to take the suitcase, that obviously is a whole thing that comes together, but then they also get connected to the prince and Kimura. It is so much, but I just, I was obsessed with these characters. They are just so unique and interesting in my head. I feel like they're ones I will never forget about. So to begin with, there's the prince, who is, I personally think, a very big commentary on um, beauty and youth in Asian countries. Um, I've actually read a whole essay about this, um, with K-pop specifically, but um, this character, he's just, he's a very young boy, not very young, he's like 12 or 14, I believe, and he's just adorable, and he's beautiful, and he has this smile that it's like every time he smiles, people just forget about what they were even mad about or asking him about. He's very, just this perfect, like a person of innocence but he kills people and he's this horrible of a child who pushed Kimura's son off of a department store roof um and I feel like he was a big commentary on the fact that in Japan and Korea and China and a lot of Asian countries if someone looks a certain way people just automatically trust them a lot more and see them as a higher value person um and I just thought it was fantastic having this psychopath of a 14 year old boy who is beautiful. I just, I thought it was a big commentary on kind of beauty, beauty in Japan and Korea and Asia and I thought it was amazing. And then we have Kimura who is just, gosh, he's, he's kind of our dumb character. <laughs> but he's just, he's such an interesting look at fatherhood in my personal opinion. He's just, he's a bad father but he wants to do everything he can to protect his son. Then we have Lemon and Tangerine who I can't remember which one is which but one of them is obsessed with Thomas and friends and is very childish but also literally a hitman uh, but he connects everything to Thomas and friends the to like the trains and then the other one he's very like cold and stoic and but he reads like Virginia Woolf in between like killing people <laughs> and then the now obviously is just very very unlucky and he is just constantly getting himself into situations and he's very gullible and just falls for like everything and he's not very good at his job but he tries he's trying <laughs> and then just oh I cannot talk highly enough about this book. I'm obsessed with it. I own the audiobook now and can 100% say I will be returning to this whenever I need a good thriller because I think, I again, I think this is my favorite thriller of all time at this point. So obsessed. I'm really nervous about the movie. It's just very whitewashed. It stars Brad Pitt and Joey King and it just sounds very, very whitewashed, but I will probably go see it and maybe I'll do a little video about it or something. But obsessed. Ugh. I'm in love with this book. It made me fall in love with reading again this month. I really was not feeling reading before I read this and now I'm just so oh I'm just reminded me what a good book is. <laughs>
And now another book that I feel like I should have liked, kind of based on bullet train, but I didn't, was I Hear Your Voice by Young Ha Kim. I'm not gonna lie. It took me until I was reviewing this book to realize I've read three books by this author and I've given all of them two stars. I didn't even realize, I didn't even realize that the two other books that I read were by the same guy. Um, I, this author is just obviously not for me. I keep picking him up on accident, I think, because he's a very highly acclaimed Korean author who has a lot of books translated into English. So when I do see a Korean book or, chi I honestly, Chinese, Japanese, Korean book, if I see it out in the wild, I pick it up. Um, and I picked this one up, I think over the summer when I was still in Portsmouth. And I'm so excited about it. We follow a character who is mute and his friend who is kind of like seen as like he kind of sees him as his own voice. And I was so excited about this book and I thought it was going to be a lot about male friendship. And that's kind of how it's pitched. And it's just not. <laughs> this it, it was about that for about 30 to 50 pages and then just everything goes to shit and it's really stupid and I didn't like it. It was just a lot of um unnecessary trauma and like kind of what what would you call that like trauma porn like is that what people call it like kind, kind of like a little life like this just, just the things that happened to him I'm just like like just stop <laughs> and then it was like suddenly we have like this weird Jesus character it was just so not good it felt like it was trying to be 17 different things to me and all I wanted was that story from the beginning of these two young boys being friends and that's all I wanted and it was just a bad book like objectively this is a bad book um and I don't know why <laughs> This author, I just do not get along with him. Um, I have literally hated everything I've read by him. So I gave this like a two star, but I would probably honestly say more like a one star. I just feel so weird giving it one stars nowadays because so many people see one stars as like problematic books, but this was just, it was just a bad book. One star, okay? One star. <laughs> But then luckily I picked up another book that I loved. Listen guys, I think I've just started realizing I need to just stay kind of in my comfort zone sometimes. Like read Japanese literature, horror, romance, and classics. And like I just can't get out of that because I read another horror book that I'm absolutely obsessed with and that is Reprieve by James Han Matson. I know a lot of people are like don't call this horror because people get the wrong impression of it but then I saw a word that describes this perfectly. This is social horror. Think Get Out. Um, I've seen people talking about this like uh, Shawshank Redemption, Us, things like that. Basically in this book we are following a couple of different timelines. We are following a court case that is happening and we're kind of seeing some questioning happening in a court case. We are then also seeing what happened in this um, uh, escape the room house, where the thing happened that the court case is about. And then we also see the preamble to lead up to what happened at this um, haunted house. So basically this takes place in Lincoln, Nebraska, which I think is really fun because I have two friends who are from Nebraska. And basically there is this place called the Quigley House. Yeah, the Quigley House. And it is just a full contact horror haunted house escape the room. And people like go in and you know, you come out bruised and battered and everything. And it's just very, very intense. And we follow our main character. I'd say her, our main character is named Kendra, who is a young girl who she moves to Lincoln, Nebraska from, I think, like Washington or something. And she is obsessed with horror. So she gets a job working at this haunted house. And then um, also just kind of her friends and people around her, or her cousin, stuff like that. And then again, we also follow these people who are in this haunted house escape room where something bad happened. We also follow this young... Vietnamese boy who comes to America um, to find an old teacher he had who he's in love with. We also follow a man who is like the owner of hotels and stuff like that. It's just a lot of very weird characters kind of all coming together for this one big climactic moment that we're leading up to with all of these points of views. I really really enjoyed this. I think it was really really well done and I think it was really well paced. This weirdly, I usually wouldn't say this as a good thing, but it felt longer than it was. Like I was so just encapsulated by this story while I was reading it that it felt like I 
was living this amount of time with them because it happens over the course of probably a couple of months or a couple of weeks and I just felt like that time was so well shown which I feel like time is something that authors really struggle to show so it was a good thing that it felt longer than it was if that makes sense I was so like just enraptured by each story I almost like felt like there were certain parts where I almost forgot that the rest of the story was even happening because we were just so in depth with this one character doing this one thing and I thought it was just so well done and then there's so much commentary on racism and sexism a lot of racism is talked about in this book which is I thought I thought the author did really really well with it they are a Korean he was born in Seoul, South Korea, and then raised in North Dakota. So he is a Korean person living in America. And this Vietnamese character obviously has a lot of racism directed towards him, but also he is very racist himself. And it was a very interesting kind of juxtaposition within the same character. And then obviously you also have just the other characters who are very experiencing racism but also racist themselves because we follow black characters we follow the asian character and we follow a white character and i just thought it was so interesting like this book could be read in schools and like analyzed you know what i mean there are so many layers to what was going on in this story and so many different topics that were being touched on in such a good and natural way it never felt like it was sitting down and like explaining what it was trying to say to you you just kind of got it you know what i mean um, but yeah, this was fantastic. I gave it like a 4.5, 5 out of 5 stars. I really, really recommend it if you like that kind of social horror or like speculative, um, books that like make commentary on societies, which are two of my favorite things, so loved it. I'm going to just very, very briefly touch on a book that I DNF'd this month, and that is The City in the Middle of the Night by Charlie Jane Anders. I just don't think I can do like hard sci-fi and fantasy anymore. Guys, I just, I couldn't, I don't know if it was just this book. I might try another one. I don't know. Um, I was so excited about this because I heard it was queer sci-fi and that's like literally all I needed to know. Um, and I literally could not stand this book. I, it, it's one of those ones that just throws you in and expects you to keep up and I couldn't do it. I got about 75, 75 pages into this and I just wasn't a fan. So I put it down. I kind of want to hear what you guys have to say about this one because if you can convince me to pick it back up, I will try it again. But I was just so confused. I had no idea what was going on. Nothing was being explained. The character, th there was just so much like stuff that I make fun of for fantasy and sci-fi in this book. Like, why does everyone need a stupid fucking name? Why does every name have to be, like, completely impossible to pronounce? Why do you have to, like, try so hard to make your world, like, so bizarre and quirky? You know what I mean? Um, and yeah, I just didn't care what was going on. I didn't know what was going on half the time. So, let me know what you think of this book and if you think I'd actually like it, because I just don't do very well with hard sci-fi or fantasy anymore. I'm just... I don't enjoy it and I'm out of the habit of reading it so I never know what's going on. And then I read a piece of non-fiction. I've actually been on my non-fiction game which I'm so excited. I read like three non-fiction already this year so I'm really excited about that. But I read Sitting Pretty by Rebecca Tausig and this was sent to me by a subscriber which I was so excited about. Um, I was so excited to read this book and I absolutely loved it. Wow I've had three five star reads this month. This, this wrap up. Not even this month. This was five stars. Um, this basically is a collection of essays and kind of like essays mixed with memoir um, of Rebecca's life and kind of being a person who's in a wheelchair and how she herself has been ableist before but also the obviously ableist things that have happened to her. Um, and I just thought it was fantastic. I will say as a person who is so in grained in the disability rights movement and I read so much literature about it and essays and academic works. Um, this was a little bit surface level which I think I also said about the other two nonfiction books I read. It's a fantastic book and I gave it five stars it deserves but for me I didn't learn a ton. I loved hearing about her own experience and I actually picked up a couple of books because of her. She has a whole little list in the back of um, books, podcasts, movies, um, and stuff like that that she mentions throughout the text and I actually picked up a couple of books because of it which was really fun but I cannot recommend this enough as an amazing starting point 
for someone who wants to learn more about disability and the disability rights movement and ableism. I think that this is a perfect place to start with it. She is so good at talking about those big picture ideas of the disability rights movement, like ableism, but also winding in her own story. Um, so you get that kind of interpersonal relationship with the author to understand um, someone who is disabled, but also she does a great way of, she just does a great job of teaching while she's telling her own story. She is a teacher, I think she's a high school teacher, um, and amazing. If I ever get to teach like college literature, you can bet that this is going to be on my reading list. A hundred percent. It was fantastic. Five stars. And then I read a book with my students. If you didn't know, I'm a special education fifth grade teacher and um, we read Number of the Stars. We, this was for, they're currently learning about World War II and the Holocaust and this was the pick for this subject. Um, I thought this was pretty good. I thought that this was a really interesting take. I'd never read this before. It's by Lois Lowry. Um, and I, I've read The Giver and a bunch of other stuff by Lois Lowry, but I've never read this one. Um, I thought it was a really interesting take because I feel like a lot of literature, especially for children, about the Holocaust follows Jewish characters, which, um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching in Georgia. A lot of people in my school are not Jewish. And so I feel like they have a lot of, they have a very difficult time relating to Jewish characters and understanding the Holocaust from a Jewish lens because they're not Jewish. Um, but I think that this one was really interesting because we follow a character who's not Jewish helping her Jewish friend. And I thought that that was a really interesting take on it. I think the kids got a lot more out of it than other Holocaust um, children's books that I feel like we could have picked from. So yeah, this one was great. I gave it, I always give the books that I read with my kids like four or five stars. I think that this one was great. Um, I had never read it before, so it was fun. So there you go. And the last book I read was just a really fun little pick that I decided to go for, which was We Could Be Heroes by Mike Chen. And yeah, this one was a, just fun. I listened to it on audiobook and I thought it was just a good time. It wasn't like mind-blowing or amazing or my favorite or anything, but it did go in directions I wasn't expecting of it, which was great, which is just a good surprise to me. Basically, we follow a world where a lot of people have superpowers. It kind of reminds me of My Hero Academia, where it's not weird if you have a superpower, but it's also not like not weird if you don't have a superpower. I don't know, it kind of reminded me more of quirks than actual superheroes or superpowers and stuff. And basically we follow a man and a woman who both have lost their memory. And they're just kind of trying to figure out who they are and how they like fit into this world. And they go to a memory loss support group together and that's how they kind of meet. And I'm not gonna lie, I was really expecting this to kind of turn into a romance and it didn't and I loved it for that. It just stayed very much as like a friendship book and I thought it was great. Um, I will say I got like a little bit lost sometimes. I think this book could have actually benefited from being a little longer and fleshing out the world just a little bit more um, because I did feel like things happened very, very fast. Like it felt like we went from one thing to another just very, very quickly. Um, but other than that, I thought this was just a lot of fun. So I gave it like a three and a half, four out of five stars. If you're a big fan of superheroes, I really highly recommend it. If you're not, don't pick it up. I, I'm kind of in between, which is why three and a half stars makes perfect sense for me for this book. But if you love superheroes, you're gonna love this. But yes, here are the eight books. Well, you know, I have five books and then a couple more that I don't have physically. The eight books that I read in the second half of January. I hope you guys all enjoyed this wrap up and definitely tell me down in the comments below what you guys read this month and what was your favorite read of January. So mine was definitely Bullet Train. <laughs> but yeah, anyways, I love y'all and I'll see y'all soon. Bye!